When I first went to stay with John Fuang, before he sent me up the mountain to meditate, he gave me a book. The book had two pieces by John Lee. One was Method Two, and the other was the Divine Mantra. In the beginning, of course, I paid most attention to Method Two. And it wasn't long, though, before he asked me to memorize the Divine Mantra. He said it would help with my meditation. As you know, it's chanting the qualities of the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, and relating them to the six properties, the six dhatu. And I found that it really did help with the meditation, thinking in terms of those properties was not part of my upbringing here in the West. It was one of the aspects of meditation instruction that were, was, that were most foreign to my background. But I did as I was told, chanted it every day. I remember one night in particular, as I was chanting, and I got to consciousness, and something inside me clicked. So this is referring to my awareness right here, right now. I saw that it spoke to my direct experience. So that's one way chanting can be useful in the meditation. You repeat something long enough, you get to know it, and you begin to realize where it connects with your experience. You know, in general, we said the meditation is helped by the chanting, simply because if you've been going through the day, picking up different issues, different concerns, and the time comes to meditate, it's good to have something to empty those issues and concerns out of the mind, to give you a different perspective. To think about the Buddha, the fact that we have a Buddha. We live in a world where there has been a Buddha, and he's left his teachings behind, and the teachings are still with us. And the message they give is always the same. It's a timeless message. And so as you're repeating the chants, it's good to think about the message, because that pulls you out of the issues of time and gets you into something timeless. Now the specific chants are supposed to have different associations. The Blessing Chants, the Mangala Sutta, is basically general auspiciousness. With the Garlini Metta Sutta, you're spreading goodwill all around, and especially with the Kantavarita, goodwill for the snakes. There's a story in the canon. A monk was bitten by a snake and died. The monks reported this to the Buddha, and he said, well, it's obvious he, he hadn't spread goodwill to the four great families of snakes. Then he taught the monks the Kantabharita. And you see that the power of the chant lies in the goodwill that goes along with it. This is what sets the Buddhist attitude towards chanting apart from other attitudes that were there in India and in India, in other teachings. It was often thought that the words themselves had power, the syllables had power. But from the Buddhist point of view, it's the intention behind the chant. In that case, it's goodwill. And goodwill expresses itself in different ways. A wish for safety. One of the chants, the, the Ratana Sutta, has a story to go with in the commentary that there was a plague in Vesali, and the Buddha had Ananda go around the city chanting this as a way of driving the plague out. But again, the power of the chant came from the, the goodwill for the citizens of Vesali. And you notice in the blessing chants, there are other chants that supposed to protect from fire, protect from illness. But here again, it's the quality of the goodwill. 
as you chant. That's what gets transmitted. And of course, the chanting is good not only for you or for the people around you. Deva is like hearing the chants. And it's not just devas in Buddhist countries. I know one Thai monk who came here to the States. One of his followers took him around the country. They got to the American Southwest. And he was meditating, and spirits of Native American children came. And so he chanted the Dhamma Chaka and the Mahasamaya for them. He said they really liked it. Because both those suttas mention a lot of devas, and they'd like to be remembered. So when you go out into the wilderness, those are two good chants to have as a kind of friendly neighbor policy. And I've noticed it creates a really good atmosphere as you chant these things. I've had some strange experiences with them. There was one time when we were building the, the jetty in Wat Tamasate. We had this wooden building that was kind of slapped together, which functioned as a kitchen and a place where the monks would have their meals as they were working on the project. And one afternoon, John Fung was sitting there, and someone had gone into the jetty. We had a painting on the wall, something I had done. The plan was to have a sculpture of a naga in the middle of the jetty. And before the sculpture came in, John Fung asked me to do a little painting of a naga. We put it on the wall. The person came running back said there was a huge snake behind the painting. The body was about the size of your wrist. It was a gorgeous snake, kind of a green-gold color. And as the person came running to see a John Fung in the little wooden building, he glanced up, and there in the rafters of the building was another snake identical to it, curled around the rafters. And John Fung sent him down to find me. I was at the bottom of the hill, and asked me to come up and chant the Mahasamaya for the two snakes. And I must have made it felt kind of strange. But as soon as I finished the chant, both snakes uncoiled themselves from where they were and went back into the forest. So I forget that was my gift to them. So it's good that you make chanting a part of your practice. It creates a good atmosphere around the monastery. It creates a good atmosphere for you. As you keep imbuing your mind with the words of the Buddha, it's so easy to get earworms. Old songs, old jingles get into your head and they don't want to leave. The only way to get them to leave is to get some chance as earworms. The chant of the 32 parts of the body, both in English and in Pali. The five reflections, and the chance for spreading goodwill. One of the most famous stories about a chant in the forest tradition is the chant that a John Mun taught to a John Cow. A John Cow had ordained, basically out of anger. He was married and had gone off to do some buying and selling, came back and found his wife with another man. And the first instinct he had was to kill them, and then he realized, okay, that would not help anything at all. So he left and ordained. And John Munn saw that he had a big issue with anger. And so he taught a John Cow a very long version of the Metta chant, where he spread goodwill to the beings in the ten directions, the four cardinal directions, the four medium directions, southwest, southeast, northwest, northeast, above and below. And not just for all beings. Ten categories of beings. Human beings, common animals, devas, 
noble ones, non-noble ones, men, women, hungry ghosts. I've forgotten the whole list. It takes a good half hour, 45 minutes, to do the whole chant. And that was the chant that calmed John Cow's mind down. So the combination of thoughts of goodwill and the fact that you're expressing them, the words vibrating through your body, can have a calming effect and create a good atmosphere in which we can practice. In some monasteries in Thailand, they chant for several hours every night. We don't do that here. I personally find that long group chanting is pretty oppressive, because everybody has to chant whatever has been decided for them. When you're chanting on your own, you're free to chant whatever you want. And as you get to know the different chants, you'll find that some of them have different flavors and have a different effect on the mind. So it's good to have a range of chants that you've memorized. I mean, the Buddha had the monks memorize lots and lots and lots of his teachings when he was alive. But you can find the chants that you find that you respond most to, either in terms of the sound or the meaning or both, and develop a repertoire. That way, when you're off meditating alone, it's like you're not alone. You've got the Buddha there with you, and you're sending out a friendly energy in all directions. So the devas and the nagas and all the other invisible beings will find your presence pleasant. And they'll be happy that you're here. So for your sake and theirs, try to develop a range of chants. Make your own chanting session part of the day, every day. <laughs> 